Yeah. One, One two, two, three. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I think Issa's kind of saw herself fitting into somebody else's crew for a second, like, Psh. I can make a whole nother crew and then them bitches don't want you. She's focused. She was trying to put together the block party. She didn't have time for that. Maybe her and Nathan hooked up, whatever. Black and faithful. I love it. Welcome to the After Party. I'm Miko Grimes. I'm Jill Monroe. And this week's episode, we have everybody's favorite asshole, the prince of pissing people off, author, the only reason I watched The Breakfast Club, Charlemagne the God. Hey, Miko. Hey, Jill. Hey. Get, we need your attention. Get off your goddamn phone, man. I don't. I don't know if I'm. I don't think I. I don't want. I don't think I'm the prince of pissing people off no more. Maybe by. It's always been by accident. I think it's more so by accident now than anything. Really? I mean, I never attempt to do it. Like that's not my thing. I don't say, "Hey, I'm gonna wake up today and piss somebody off." But well, you do it so well, man. You they, do. It yeah, they, they they mad at me now because this morning I tweeted out that um. The Michael Jordan uh, flu, the flu games, I, I called them the food poison 11s, right? But I was like, yo, these are, I, cause I love the sneakers because they look good. They just hurt my feet, but they actually aren't 11s, they're 12s. And people so mad at me about that. I'm not no fucking sneakerhead. Yeah. Sneakerheads take that seriously. People get so mad about things that don't matter at Don't the matter. Yeah. And then a young nigga gonna tell me I'm showing my age. Nigga, Jordans came out in 96, fuck nigga. <laughs> Like, that's our era. I was hooping in them in, in college. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we all old. Fuck that. But listen, um, Charlamagne, how you been doing the quarantine? I seen you put your hairline on Instagram Live. I mean, that was very brave of you. You know, I, I'm proud of you. Like, what, what made you just say, fuck it? Let me just put it out there. Chico B. Chico got the uh, hair. I think he called it the Hairline Chronicles or Quarantine Hairline Chronicles. I saw it, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And I just saw Chico doing it. And I was like, shit, I don't give a shit. I don't care. Like, you know, this ain't nothing but a, I have a baldy. I have a baldy as soon as this shit over. I'm putting Monistat 7 and Jamaican castor oil in it now, though. Monistat 7? What the fuck is Monistat? It was antibacterial. So, you know, didn't Regina Hall say that you worked that on your edges? I've never tried it. Castor oil I'm all with, but it's antibacterial. It seems like it's working. Yes. Well, Charlotte, may I know that you hadn't met my co-host Jill before. This is Jill Moreau. Jill is awesome at everything, by the way. Hey, so you got to check out some of her content. L.A. native, you know. Yes. They but mentioned my neighborhood on this episode of Insecure. We'll talk about that. What, was she was running through the, um, where, where to find a man at? Yeah. Okay. Well, so we'll talk about that. From? Huh? What part is that? Um, she said Ladera was where the rich niggas are, and while technically factual, they married. And yes, that's how I was old. Like they're all married. All they married. married. Do you yeah. know? I listen. I look up and down my block, and all I see are families. <laughs> so okay, because she said see. she said all the Dinas is where the married niggas was at. No, she, well, Dinas is where the married ones are. She said the rich ones are in Ladera, but I'm saying they're rich and married. So got you. Got you. Yes. Yeah, you want to be in a side chick? Nothing. I don't want one, but you know. Oh man, get the hell out of here! I, I'm so glad y'all still. Isn't he on his faithful? I think it's his faithful black man. I mean, you know, side chick is an opportunity for some. Black and faithful. I love it. I like it though, because you know what? It's giving us hope. Even if you say it one day, you might mean it. I do mean it. I I I, I have not cheated in four four years. Are you? I, October 2016 was the last time, and I, and I shouldn't be applauded for that. But I'm just being honest and very saying, you know, because that's, monogamy is very difficult, Charlemagne. It's very difficult. It's. Re I mean, listen, it's not right. It, it 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 only is when you're not happy with what you got at home. If so, if something is not happening at home, then it's easier for you to go out there and do that. For a man, though, it's just physical with me. I don't. I'm not missing nothing at home. I just was liking other pussy. 
tagging Which isn't that part of your job, like wealthy men in entertainment, sports, politics? Doesn't that just kind of go hand in hand at some point? Maybe yeah, Chris Rock, Chris, Chris Rock once said the smartest quote. He said that a man is only as faithful as his options. Wow. So I, yeah. a, lot, a lot of these people in these positions, we have a lot of options. You know what I mean? So it's just like, it's just really about what you devote your energy to. And that's why I've devoted my energy to my wife, to my family. And that is more fulfilling to me. And a lot of times that should be an ego boost, right? Like I only do it for ego. I'm only fucking with other women for ego. To see you know what I'm about it, to see that's people it. Feel on you. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing more. And that's whack. Like now I have other ways to, to feed my ego and they have nothing to do with, with that. Wow. Look, at you just sound like a completely different person, man. This is great. This is great to hear. I'm sure the knowledge. I don't really hear men talk like this. I'm keeping it real. Most men, even if they agree with what you're saying, they don't say it. You know? They don't actually say it because it's well, cool to be a dog-ass nigga. It, I, think it wa I don't think it is as much as it, is, it was. Like back in the day, you got to think even with the music, the lifestyle, the culture, it was a lot of encouragement of that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Now it's like more encouragement of the opposite, you know, find you a good woman, get married, have some kids, like really have that stability, you know what I mean? And I think a lot, of, and, and the, the music has a lot to do with that too, the culture does, because you see Jay-Z and Beyonce, you see, you know, uh, LeBron and his wife, you see Kevin Hart and his woman, like you see all of these great black couples that are together, you know what I mean? And having these families and it looks dope, it looks cool. I think all the two guys you mentioned have side bitches though, but we gonna move on. I don't know nothing about that. Okay. So let's Man. <laughs> Are you caught up? Have you been watching the show? Yes. Yes. So this episode, we're we going to just do, basically, we're going to run down the show in order and just talk about our favorite scenes, what we felt about them, what we didn't feel about them. We're going to continue on. We got a couple questions at the end. I know you have to leave early, so if you have to check out early, we're going to let you go. Me and Jill are going to finish it up, okay? Okay. All right, so this episode is called what, Jill? Low-key... Oh, shit. Done. Low-key done. Low-key done. Done. <laughs> So we saw it at the end why she said she was low-key done, obviously. Um, she's running from Molly at this point, but we're going to rewind all the way to the beginning where she starts off the episode. You know, like a lot of us, you open your phone, you go on Instagram, first thing you see, you know, is her, all the comments from her block party, which was an incredible success. And then she's got all these missed phone calls and voicemails from her friends wanting to talk about it. She starts arguing with herself about whether or not she should contact Molly first, and then she talks herself into believing that she always, you know, extends the olive branch or, you know, is the one that reaches out. Do you remember that to be true? Like, I'm not sure if I remember that that's always what she does. I think that with Issa, she is the more agreeable one. She is the one that will sort of move her position a bit to make people more comfortable because the whole thing is she's awkward, right? So when she gets in those situations where she doesn't know how to address things, I think that she does bend a little bit easier. I don't know if she's always exactly the one to come, but she definitely, in the Molly Issa friendship, she's the number two. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't noticed because they didn't build they didn't build that conflict up until this season. I never paid attention to a conflict between Molly and Issa until this season. Like before that, cool. it was all the love. first episode started with that with broken pussy, and she told Issa that she was a dumb bitch if she believed that Daniel was gonna be good for her. I think that they have always had little undertones within their friendship. I think it's a woman thing, maybe, but you know, if you have a friend that kind of thinks well. I'm the lead, you're the entourage, and that's kind of the subtleties I got. I picked up through their friendship through all four seasons, actually. That makes sense, because Issa used to also call Molly a hoe. Yes, she is a hoe. If you look at the body counts of this, this show, they've given Molly way more bodies than Issa, like way more. And it's been one year, if y'all think about it, season one started a year ago. She was 29, now she's 30. Look at all the bodies Molly has had. If you, think, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy, but she does. So anyways, um, so let's, op the opening scene, we talked about that. And then she ends up going out trying to do self-care Sunday stuff. Like, you know how you try to stay busy when you're trying to avoid your friend, avoiding conflict, trying to, you know, fake like you got so much going on. She's cleaning up and, and doing all this shit. And then Nathan calls. Nathan, when is she going to fuck Nathan again, first of all? Like, when the last time Issa had some pussy? TSA Bay? When he came in and broke the condom? 
No, the fat dude. That's TSA. That's TSA Bay. Okay, okay. That was way the fuck back. That was two <laughs> episodes ago. But in t- chronological time, that was Thanksgiving. Uh, it's January, it's January now. now. Okay. Oh, maybe they just haven't shown us. I don't know, but she had no dick. She's been. She spoke in. She was trying to put together the block party. She didn't have time for that. Maybe her and Nathan hooked up, whatever. But Nathan ghosted her, so I wouldn't be so quick to just pop out on him I- again either. But if a nigga ghosts you and he pull up and, and do what he did to get Ben Staples, like, come on, you got you got to exclude that. That ghost didn't even happen at this point. Now they equal. Don't you agree? I don't feel like they explained TSA Bay enough either. I need to know why she was just fucking a random fat nigga. They didn't explain that. There was a lot skipped, and we talked about that in the other episodes. So I'm like, wait a minute, how they just skip this shit? I want to know how these people got here. Uh, they skipped Christmas and New Year, so I thought that that would be would have been a good time to show more family stuff, you know, and everything. But I think that because there's only episode, eight episodes, maybe they just got to get all to it and shit, you know. What you said about Nathan is real though, because that's something that guys do, right? But that's a real dude. Like he helped Issa, not because he was looking for anything in return. Mm-hmm. But just because he had the plug. But he knows that that's kind of like a down payment on, you know, future relationships with Issa. He knows that. Yeah. He knows that. It would have got me back in. It would have definitely. <laughs> he helped you get some money. Yeah. You know I mean? that's, that's a different kind of hustle. Like, he helped you, he helped you, you know, put on an event. Like, he saved your life when you really needed it. That's different than, you know, here's a bag or here's $1,000, $40, like. He really looked he invested out. invested in her as a person. Boom. Yeah. Well, we always need, I, I always talk about that. Like when I see girls on Instagram with like bad teeth in their mouth, like a rotten tooth or bad, whatever, but they got hella bags and purses from dudes. And I'm just like, so he didn't want to invest in your smile. Like he would rather give you a bag. Nathan has invested in her business. And if you notice, he's been the one like cheering her on this whole time. Her friends didn't think she could pull it off. Molly been hating. Nathan has really been there putting the battery in her back from the beginning, from Coachella, to even tell her to do it. And then he's the one that ends up coming through, getting her the big lead act and everything. So I just feel like he deserves some pussy at this point. I mean. <laughs> oh, I mean, listen, okay. I mean, you know, she, she, she should have got some dick that night. Like, that was a great night. Like, she should have ended that with some. some well, like, Molly fucked it up. Huh? Molly fucked it up with all her hate and all that extra negativity for no reason. Man, man, man. Yeah, that, Molly, I don't know what, Molly's jealous. I don't know what's going on. One of our, I'm going to get to one of our questions at the end, and I'm hoping you're around for it, uh, Charlamagne, because I want to ask you specifically. But, Jill, let's move on to the, uh, the Good Samaritan scenes. Talk about what happened there. So, Issa in the store, you know, we've all been there. Someone asking for some help in line, pregnant woman. Issa's like, uh, I think I got it. Pull through, car gets declined. The pregnant woman who was just begging hit her with, you know, perspective. That's what I've gotten from this situation, not the groceries that I may or may have not needed. Perspective. That had to make Issa feel a bit low in that moment. But also, why are you overextending yourself? If you can... Give her five dollars on it. Put five on it. Don't try if you can't or you aren't sure. Why are you doing that? And we saw that come up again when she went to the paint and sip alone with her big jug gallon of Carlos Rossi. <laughs> I don't know what that was. You know what's it? it, was it was it you said it was what? Like, she said it was some form of Pinot. Yeah, I think it's Carlos Rossi is the company, the brand, I think, you know. Carlos Rossi, like, that's the old school, right? They used to make. <laughs> and with the handle, you know, with the little knuckle handle. Yeah, man. This her up- DC homegirls, her new friends, and offers them wine. We see Kyla Pratt, which we always love to see Kyla. Shout out to her, you know, represent. PG County, that's the equivalent of Ladera. So, Pretty Girl County, that's where the rich. Charlotte, man, you, have, you guys have a Pretty Girl County because I'm not trying to hate, but the majority of New York men that I meet tell me that New York women are, are unattractive. And- that's, that's Baltimore. That's Baltimore. Oh, wow. oh, listen, I'm from South Carolina, so, you know, <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean, I've been, with, I've been with a few New York women. I think it's beautiful women in New York. It's beautiful women in New York. It's just that their hustle is different. You know what I mean? I think a lot of women in New York, they're not looking for, like, a, 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 a man, a good man, per se. They're just looking for the best deal. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. So I, I mean, that's that, that's how, that has been my experience. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. But you know, you know, it's, it's interesting with the Issa thing, right? When you talk about that Good Samaritan scene, and even the scene when she was with the four women, all I saw was trauma in Issa, yo. Mm -hmm. Like trauma, Issa got like a, a a wounded inner child, and like that's why she's so eager to people please, and she's always overextending herself to people. You know, what I'm saying, I stay in places longer than she she should have because her inner child is is saying, "Damn, finally somebody loves me." Yeah. And I think that to me, that's what that is. When I see that, I, I, it's, I think that's going to come back around where they're going to show us she deals with a lot of trauma, especially being that they bring in like her mom and stuff in the picture mm -hmm. now and her family. They're going to show us something that makes us realize why she is the way that she is. Yeah. And I also noticed um, in, the, in these, uh, these Good Samaritan scenes where she is not recognizing like when she's overextending herself, when she's doing too much. Like she, she, she obviously don't have $150 in her bank account. Like you should know that. Like before you offer to pick up somebody's entire bill, mm -hmm. then she picks up the old man who's, oh, yeah, I about he's super rude to her. Like most old people are like, he reminded me of my grandmother, like rest in peace to my dear. But my grandmother was the nicest, most meanest motherfucker on earth. And this guy's complaining about the air and everything, but he, he did give her some jewels on his way out of the car, you know? So sometimes, you know, being a good Samaritan, you can't pick up ju jewels from that. I feel like she picked up a jewel from the girl in the store, basically that stop trying to help everybody. You know, she picked up a jewel from getting, uh, picking up the old man of, you know, you, you're extending yourself too much. And then with the girls with the wine, they played her so clean. Did you even see that coming? Did either one of you guys see that, that game coming? No. Nah. No. I, I, I thought, I mean, I didn't, I thought maybe she would think that she made some friends and didn't. I like the fact that she was putting herself out there in that manner to meet new people. But... You know, when they, when she said, let's go to the bathroom, I was like, oh, something's like, not about to be good here. The girl didn't ask Issa to go. Issa volunteered, so it wasn't technically a setup. I think what might have happened if she didn't say I'm going to go is all three of them would have went to the bathroom and then ditched her that way. You know, but mm -hmm. it seems like they've done this before or something because that was smooth, honey. Let me tell you, that was smooth as shit. She was in that bathroom talking to herself. In like 10 seconds, that girl had done, got up off the toilet and quietly left. She was like, so where'd you meet the guys at? You seem like you connected. Are you the plug? And Issa was just like, ooh, I'm being appreciated for my talents. Let me spill. Let me spill. That, that scene was interesting to me, too, because it's kind of like um, one of those, the grass ain't green on the other side scenes. Because it's like she, was, she, she just had to fall out with Molly the night before. And she was kind of ignoring her, her other friend Kelly all day and ignoring her people all day. And then she ends up meeting this new crew, right? And I think in her mind, she's like, damn, I can meet new friends. I can meet new people. And then she realizes, like, damn, they fucked me over. You got to stick with your own friends. Like, at least even you know, if they ain't going to do no shit like that to you. Yeah, you know? even if things are bad, figure out a way to make it work as opposed to just saying, nah, fuck all of them. Because she was ignoring her friends all day long. She ignored oh. everybody. Her brother, she was ignoring. Even that personal assistant girl who was hilarious to me now. She, the text message she was sending was so funny. But um, what I noticed about that other crew of girls is they're kind of like Molly's crew. If you think about it, Kyla is Tiffany to me. Mm -hmm. um, the other girl that painted the dick is clearly Kelly, you know, with the sense of humor and always talking about fucking. And I guess the other girl would be Molly because she's the pretty one. I, I don't think Molly, Molly isn't ugly or nothing like that, but that girl, all they really kind of told us was she was pretty, the, Pretty Girl County, she seemed like the one that might be the most successful, possibly. Mm -hmm. I think Issa's kind of saw herself fitting into somebody else's crew for a second, like, Psh, I can make a whole nother crew, and then them bitches don't want you. You gotta stick with your you. own crew. I think also to the point is until you fix the problems that you have within yourself, even if you move to a new crew, some of the same issues are going to resurface because you haven't adjusted to your overextending yourself or not really wanting to speak up and use your voice in certain moments. So I think that that was um, pivotal too. Yeah. yeah. And then Molly, you know, Molly told you the last episode where she played back in her mind, you're selfish. Mm -hmm. Oh, you always using mm -hmm. people. I think that that's her inner voice already. And Molly was just reinforcing it. So she was going out of her way 
You know what I mean? To not be selfish, to help other people. And then she probably got, she got fucked over. Now she got to be thinking to herself, why did this always happen to me? Yeah. yeah. When, when the reality didn't have nothing to do with her. No. With other people. Yeah. Because even Nathan was telling her like, no, you didn't use me. Like I was exactly. able to help and I helped. Like that's, if you're not useful, you're useless. That's right. In any relationship, like at all, friends, anything, you know? And so I just think that she was allowing what Molly was saying to her, like, like whenever people say stuff about me that's not true, I might retaliate and talk some shit, but I never allow myself to get pissed off about things about that are said about me that aren't true, you know? And, and I, it took me a long time to get there to that point where I'm, I'm like, cause it, it'll bother you. Just think having somebody you care about thinking something like that about mm -hmm. you, you know, like you'll start to, you know, self, you know, destroy yourself, you know, like, like you said, Charlotte, man, like you just start overthinking it and trying to overcompensate for something that's really not true. You know, you, you, you're, none of your friends should say you're using them, especially not a friend of that long, you know? We're friends. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, you know, feed off each other and utilize each other's resources. Instead of saying you, that's what we should start saying, utilize. Mm. I should be able to utilize my friends. You're right. That's right. it. That's it right there. One of the things that she picked up on these scenes, too, is that she doesn't know her title. She doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know what she's about. And from them asking her, like, what do you do? What do you She actually came up with that cultural curator is what she called herself. And then she, uh, she ended up uh, going home and uh, typing out, you know, typing some more uh, comments and replying to people and realizing, I think what she realized, you guys let me know if I'm right, that she needs a website. That she yeah. needs taking herself way more serious. Yeah. Yeah, when she responded to that guy and she said something like, you know, when the person said, where can I find more of this? And he, she was like, coming soon. She's going to definitely build some type of digital hub. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that it was good for her because sometimes we don't, like when your friends aren't helping you or putting that battery in your back, like I just feel like her friends never believed in her. Nobody thought she could even do it. And she's kind of out here by herself. And that's a tough spot to be in because your friends are supposed to, you guys are supposed to be a unit coming together, thinking together. If one of your friends has a great idea and that happened, she should have been like brainstorming with them to like, okay, well, help me out. What's next? That's what your friends are for. Mm -hmm. Especially since she's been in the situation like this where she hasn't really had a career since the show started. But I think that that's part of the problem, too, is because sometimes your friends still see you where you're at. And even though on the surface they're encouraging you, they may not fully think that you can get there. Those, sometimes some of those people are the last to get on board because they've seen whatever came before. Mm -hmm. And it's not fair. That's why sometimes you have to separate, though, and just build it and come back around. It's not always the greatest, but I think that that is, especially with Molly, a lot of what they're dealing with. I agree wholeheartedly. That's where bragging comes into play, right? Because a lot of times we're bragging not because we, you know, being arrogant or being narcissistic. We're just trying to let people know, like, I have leveled up in life, and I need you to move accordingly, okay? I'm not that same person. You can't talk to me the way you used to talk to me or deal with me the way you used to deal with me. Like, things have changed. You know, sometimes we, we really want to just shout our evolution and our growth from the mountaintops. That's what I, that's what I think that is. And, you know, one of the things, shout out Tax, uh, I'm finally getting a video uh, visit from him Wednesday. But one of the things that he told me is stop expecting my friends to champion me, to support me, to do that. It's really people that don't know you, that really get on board on your wave and carry you there. Your friends don't ever, like, care enough sometimes to, or even know that you need them to you know, cheer you on and be out there supporting you and helping you grow your your business. It's always strangers sometimes that make your friends realize, oh shit, my friend is dope. My friend, you know, got shit popping. And that's kind of sad, but it's- It is. That's why I go out of my way to celebrate my folks. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to tell people how, you know, dope your peoples are, or how dope something they're doing is. Like you, ha you have to go out of your way to do that. You got to Diddy Khaled this shit. You should Diddy and Khaled all your fucking friends. You should yeah. be their biggest cheerleader. Yeah, like, it, it costs you nothing to do that, and it doesn't hurt anything. All you're doing is helping. 
But don't you think sometimes that people don't do that is because when they see you winning in certain areas, it highlights their own inadequacies or things that maybe they feel about themselves or their roles? Not everyone, but I think that sometimes if a friend is trying to move ahead or grow and maybe they're struggling, maybe not in the same area in some fashion, and the other friend moves ahead, they kind of feel left behind, not intentionally, but that... You know. I, think, I think you're right, Jill. You know me. I would tell people to change their perspective the way they look at it, right? Because they always say that, you know, you're the sum total of the five or six people that you talk to on a regular basis, right? So if you start to see those five or six people grow and evolve and end up in positions of power, end up in positions of purpose, you should be happy because they're all a reflection of you. And if you haven't gotten to where you're supposed to be yet, it's only a matter of time. Clearly, you're in the right circle. So I would just tell people to, to change their perspective when it comes to things like that. Don't look at a person and say, oh, are they moving faster than me? Are they getting farther than me? It's like, no, they're on their journey, and your blessing is soon to come. Yeah. I was so happy to see her reach out to her mom and go over there. Like, she needed that hug, that, that cry. Like, that's, Charlamagne, you brought that up before. There's trauma there. You know, that she's not talking about. And it, it just and her mama could feel it probably over the phone. She came over. She sensed it in person. She tried to offer a gumbo. Who's turning down gumbo? Like, yeah. I'm plant-based, and I can't turn down gumbo shit. And so she had that cry. I, I got weak. I weeped a little bit inside when I saw that. I was just like, oh, my God. Like, to see her on such a high the day before and everything in her life starting to kind of happen, and she's crying. And I was like, this could be a good cry, but it felt like a sad one to me. She just needed her mom. She needed her mom for reassurance, for, you know, all those feelings that she was trying to sort through. And it obviously helped because, like you said, when she went home, she got back up on her game, got her game face together. But, um, you know. I, I feel like, you know, with scenes like that, I feel like we're, we're actually about to see why the show is called Insecure. Because mm. I see insecurity in the two main characters. I see it in uh, Molly. And I see it in Issa. I see a lot of insecurity in both of them. And I think we're really about to see, you know, why they are both so, so insecure. Yeah, I was, I was happy that, you know, she ended up finally calling Kelly back. And Kelly gave her some, like, Kelly's usually bad at, you know, these things. But Kelly was right in this moment. And she brought up how her and Tiffany had the rift with the baby shower. And she was like, you know, if we had waited longer, we could have really lost our friendship. And sometimes, you know, you need to, even if you're tired of being the, the one extending the olive branch and, and, and being the person that reaches out, if the friendship really matters to you, you would do it. And it made me feel like Issa is really like done with Molly. Like she's really like, I don't really need her as a friend. Like she, she's really riding this. I don't, I, even though Molly's pissing me off, I still want them to be friends. I think, I mean, we saw how much of a punk Issa is because if you randomly end up at the same restaurant, the Ethiopian spot, go in. That's random. That's a perfect way to get that communication started. But Issa runs from communication and that's why it takes her so long to finally get to the point or get to the root of the problem. They both are just, you know, pride. Yeah, I mean, Issa's not good at confrontation, right? That's why she always talks to herself in the mirror and tries to, tries to psych herself up into going to have these conversations that she's having with herself with the person she's actually mad at, but that never really happens. And I also think Molly and Issa really just, it's not that they hate each other. It, whenever somebody is really close to you, when y'all beef, even if it's small, it seems like y'all fucking hate each other. But that's only because the love is so strong between y'all. So you're really hurt. They're both really hurt and don't know how to communicate that hurt to each other. Yeah. Do you do you think that, you know, when she remember she has all these scenes where she looks in a mirror of reflection and her other person is always kind of talking to her, whether right or wrong, talking her into doing something. And then in that moment, she looked at the reflection, like, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And the reflection pretty much was like, do whatever you feel is right. Like, yeah. trust yourself. And yeah. she didn't go in there. Like, that's that's what made me think low key done. Basically, like, here's a perfect opportunity. It was set up this way. You guys are obviously best friends. You're both trying to avoid each other, and you end up at the same spot because you're best friends, because this is what you both would do in these situations. And I thought that was a perfect opportunity for her to just be like, fuck it. I'm just going here. 
But to me, it was her saying, nah, I'm moving on. Like, is this the end of the friendship? I don't think it's the end of the friendship because we have too many episodes left to go. But I, 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 is it two or is it, it's yeah. not two? Okay. Yeah, only two left. Because this is episode six and there's only eight. You I got 10 this season. I th- yeah, I think it has 10 this season. I think. I'm not sure. I think. I think it has 10 this season. I think he's right. I, I feel like she, it, her doing that just shows the work that she has to do on herself and that she has to learn how to take things head on. And we'll see how that manifests. We're going to, I assume by the preview of the next episode, we'll see what Molly's been on and, and how she you know, took those words. I think, you know, plus your friend says you always need just one more thing and blew up at you and put her finger in your face at the event. You're going to internalize that probably for more than just a day, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm one of those people. uh, I'm not ready to have a conversation until I'm ready to have a conversation. But if I would have pulled up at that Ethiopian spot and I saw her in there, we all know food is comfort in a lot of places. So like you said, you know, they both ended up at that spot because that's their security blanket. I would have looked at that as a sign. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I would have been like, man, fuck it. Let me go in here and have a conversation. If she don't want to, that's on her. But at yeah. least I, I attempted. Yeah, I would have took my food to go if I, if, I, if I walked in there and I felt any type of energy that wasn't, you know, welcoming to a discussion. I would have just been like, got you. Got my shit to go and dip because at that point now you're validated if you're trying to avoid her or not talk to her. You can go back to your friends and be like, I tried to reach out. Yep. She didn't want to talk. Like I shouldn't have been doing it anyway, but I, I did it. And she was the one not, you know, receiving my energy. So but but to uh, to but Molly doesn't know she was there. You know what I mean? So it's not like she can she you know she can use that. And yeah. and just like you brought up before, Jill, like the sneak peek of Molly on vacation in Mexico with Andrew. Do you think that's his brother, friend? Like, who do you think that is? Because they didn't Well, that's that. definitely family. I think that she is getting, she's going to learn more about, remember, because her whole issue was, I don't really know him. I don't know about his backstory. So I think she's going to learn some things about his family that are going to tell her some things about him and determine if she's really comfortable in this relationship. Yeah. I'm pumped. I know we got Charlamagne. I get out of here soon, but I want to ask you this question, Charlamagne, before you get out of here. Why does no one like Molly? This came from Instagram. I, I don't really know who added it, but why do you think nobody likes Molly? As far as on the show? Yeah, because all of my listeners, they put in questions for this episode. Not a single, I have not had one comment even on, on YouTube of anybody defending Molly at all, really. Well, I mean, well, they, they're painting Molly as the the obvious villain this season, right? Like, clearly Molly has a problem with Issa, and we don't really know what that problem is. And what she did at that at Issa's um, block party, that was corny as fuck. Like, that wasn't even worth the big blow-up that she had right there in that moment, but that lets you know that they've had some underlying issues, things have been building up. So from the outside, you know, looking in, for us, to this moment, at this particular moment, everything we've seen thus far... You know, Issa doesn't deserve the treatment that she's receiving from Molly. Now, a couple episodes might happen in the future, and we might get it a little bit more. But as as of right now, no. no. So we, are, we are mad at Molly. We ain't fucking with Molly. Nobody want. We don't want people like that around us. That's just some hating ass shit. What she did to Issa was just some hating ass shit. Like there was no point to that at all. And you know she I mean? really didn't actually use her. She actually didn't use you. Like, that's her old dick. Charlamagne, are you a fa- I, this, I've been saying this since episode one. Once my fish, always my fish. And I feel like if, 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 if you have a friend, if you have a guy that you're dealing with, you can always go back to him and ask him for help, even fuck him still if you want to. Like, you could do whatever you want. So when Molly didn't help her, she had every right to go to the guy whose roommate's she didn't even really need Molly if you're keeping it real. She could have always went to Nathan. But I think that's what Molly wanted. That's her friend. This is a big moment for Issa, right? Mm-hmm. Molly wanted to be a part of that moment in, 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 in a way other than just showing up to support. You know what I mean? Like, she really wanted to be there for Issa in a real way. I think she's just hurt that she wasn't. Can I also point out that in episode one, when, they, when Issa was having the little mixer, Molly told her 
because she was jealous of Condola. You have people too. I'm bringing Andrew. He works for Live Nation. So, mm, 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 mm. so she put him up as a potential source and sponsor to dig into. Let's not forget that. So Molly's playing. She did say like, bitch, I got, I got the connect. I'm fucking this nigga. So if you ever need something, you can hook me. You, you know, you got juice too in this in this industry. She well, she's, she's telling Issa to come through my pussy with that though. <laughs> Don't just go, don't just bypass my pussy and go to my dick. Talk to me and let me put that play together. But That's she didn't want to do it. She would have did it. She didn't. She did. That is true. She, I think, I mean, you know, she wanted Issa to be, she wanted Issa to listen more. She wanted Issa to be that ear, that comfort, that bounce thing. And Issa was busy. Neil, do you have a question for Charlemagne or for both of us? Well, it's for both. Well, it's for you, kind of. It's for him. The first, it's just the people wanted to know, are those descriptions of L.A. men, black men and where to find them? Because, well, you don't know because you're married. It's a problem. No, 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 no. I got plenty of single friends, honey. Let me tell you. The one part that was right was the zesty men for sure. <laughs> West Hollywood is Boys Town. It has been. Um, Silver Lake for the artsy type. I think that that's, I don't go to Pasadena. I don't really go out that way. Go to the Boys and Girls Club there. That is it. And every now and then go, I go to Santa Viga Taco, a vegan taco truck that's out there too. Shout out them. Yeah, and I covered Ladera. So, but there is one question that kind of goes back to the episodes. It's about um, Lawrence. Do you think that Lawrence handled the breakup with Condola and letting Issa know that whole process well. Do you think that how he rolled that out, kind of talked to Issa, his issues with Condola, do you think that he did that from a Black faithful man's perspective? I don't think Lawrence owed Issa anything mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I don't think Issa owed that young lady anything. Like, they weren't friends. It's not like they were in the same circles or they were associates before that. They weren't friends. So that was just some random, some, some coincidental shit that happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that Lawrence and that woman ended up sleeping with each other or dating and Issa and her ended up working together. I don't think none of them owed each other any explanation. That just lets me know that Lawrence and Issa still love each other. Mm, told That's you, awesome. girl. I told you. They and love each other. The reason that I think that he's he's ghosting right now, he, he has disappeared, he hasn't really said anything, and I think he's doing that because all this entire time he knew that it was going to blow up, like it wasn't going to work out between Condola working with Issa. Like that situation was not going to work out because if you really think about it, all it did was make Lawrence be more around Issa, like more involved in her business. And then to hear all the, remember the little, uh, the little inside things that, Issa was sharing with Condola about him. Like, he started realizing, damn, me and Issa have a lot of memories. I've told her everything about me. Like, she knows me better than anybody else. So when they broke up, I think he disappeared like that because he felt like, shit, I should have never did this to begin with, honestly. I think that once he realized they were dealing with each other in that business sense, he would have had to make a decision at that point. Like, he, he needed to make a decision. I see why Issa did what she did, because she needed help. You know, but I don't know why Lawrence was, was doing it because it was clear that he was still, you know, in love with Issa, in my opinion. He was going hard in the paint, though. Maybe you, you don't think he was going to try and hold them both down? He doesn't really seem like the player type to work that. Nah, Lawrence ain't got that in him. He ain't got that juice in him like that. Uh, one more question since Charlotte's still here. Uh, do you think that Molly is going to – because we when, when the sneak peek, it looked all positive. Her, her, Molly and Andrew looked like they were having a great time. She looked a little annoyed by the homeboy, brother, cousin, whoever he is, scheduling everything. You know, she seemed like she was off it. She really wanted to just kick with him. But do you think that somehow, some way, that Molly is going to ruin the vacation? Because they didn't show us any ruin, and, and Issa is always telling her how she's always ruining relationships. I think so. I think that – um the same way we saw uh, Issa and those three girls, it, it seemed all lovey-dovey, but it didn't end well. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be the same thing with Molly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, th I think it's going to be the same exact thing. I think it's going to be some way, somehow, they all realize they need each other more than they need other people. And whatever wholeness they're lacking has nothing to do with other people. It has to do with them. 
And I think Molly's going to realize that on vacation. Wow. When she's zip lining back down the hill, I would be kind of mad if you dropped a zip line on me without telling me. I need to know I, that. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> with those shits. I mean, no, I'm with the shits. I'm a zip line, but tell me that I'm hiking to go zip line. Don't surprise me when we get to the top. I might have to psych myself out for that. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm adventure Kelly, but with patience. <laughs> Yeah, and you know how this episode, Issa was hearing what Molly said to her? I think next episode, Molly's going to hear what Issa said about her in her head. And she's going to be playing that back. And it's going to be playing out on the episode. And she's going to realize, like, God damn it, I am always fucking up my relationship. And hopefully, hopefully she doesn't fuck up the relationship. I really want it to work, even though I don't see one attractive thing about Andrew, like, whatsoever like you didn't like when he was flipping the hair that didn't work for you no that didn't work and then when he did the wobble it really made me not like him anymore his wobble <laughs> was trash i was impressed that he knew how to wobble but but it was a trash wobble he works at live nation he should know how to wobble right well, Charlemagne, we're going to let you get out of here. We're going to end the show, too. In case there are people that actually don't know who you are, please let the people know about how, how they can reach you. Look at your books. Hey. My son, I had to get the audio version uh, for uh, this one because there were so many words he did. He kept saying, what does this word mean? What, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> so I had to get the audio version for him, and he's actually listened to this. It's I appreciate that. Thank you. Go ahead and tell the people about yourself. Um, see the God on Twitter, see the God on Instagram, listen to the breakfast club, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Monday through Friday on your local radio station. We on it like a hundred markets. Listen to the brilliant idiots podcast every week with Andrew Schultz. And yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Miko. Thank, thank you, Jill. Well, thank, thank you so much for coming on, Charlamagne. I know you're a busy man. I appreciate your time. All right. Peace. Thank All right. You. Peace. Well, thank you guys for checking out the after party. Low key done. And we are high key done. I'm Jill Monroe. Hit me up with questions at Stiletto Jill everywhere. Stiletto Jill at gmail.com. I believe that's my email. <laughs> I'm iHeartMiko on all platforms. And my email is iHeartMikoGrimes at gmail.com. We are low key done. See y'all next week. Peace. It's the after party, Miko.